Welcome to the Connor's Corner segment of Ask the Lawyer. Uh, a few months ago, around Christmas time, one of my employees, Bridget O'Day, bought me a book, The Immortal Irishman by Timothy Egan. And we're very pleased to have him today on our show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. We heard the song, and a lot of people out there know exactly who General Marr is, and some other people don't. So who was General Marr? Yeah, it's interesting. There's a fair amount of people, and we have, what, 40 million Irish Americans in this country, and a fair amount of people um, have never heard of him. He he was at one point easily the most famous Irish American on the planet. I mean, I would say not until John F. Kennedy came along was there anyone who was so renowned. He he changed history on three continents, his own home in Ireland, in Tasmania, Australia, where he was sentenced and exiled to be a political prisoner, and in the United States, where he was one of the first immigrants to come aboard in that huge immigration surge and ultimately became a general in the Civil War and a governor in the state of Montana. So he crammed an awful lot of living into a relatively short time. And in his life, you see the whole Irish-American experience, essentially. What made you, what drew, drew you to write about Thomas Francis Marr? You know, I'm sort of, I, I'm Irish on both sides of my family, and I've traced my lineage back to the old side. And, but I, you know, I was sort of an elapsed Irish-American. I mean, I'm assimilated like a lot of people, and I you know, celebrate on St. Patrick's Day and uh, do all the things, but um, it, it wasn't until I started to look into Mars' background that I, I really got deep into my own history. You know, my family had come to Montana like so many Irish had done. My family came here with the Great Famine when a million Irish died in four years, one of the great crimes in Europe, and another million were forced to leave. I mean, essentially a fourth of the country I emptied out. And that's my own history. And I found out that was my own family. So when I started to get into Mars' story, his personal story, um, it sort of roused this latent spirit inside of me. Mar was born in, in Waterford, and he was from a relatively wealthy family. Now, how did an Irish Catholic become wealthy in, in Ireland in the early 1800s? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question, because as you know, you know, you couldn't serve in Parliament, for example, if you didn't uh, renounce your religion for most of Irish history, for much of Irish history, you couldn't own land. You couldn't even own a horse worth more than five pounds if you were Irish Catholic. It's, it's just it was a crime to be Irish. And so the way the Mars got wealthy was by leaving. I mean, they moved to <clears throat> Newfoundland, which was the first English colony. And there they made a fortune as merchant families and as a merchant family. And only when they came back with all of their merchant wealth from Newfoundland and reestablished themselves in Waterford, um, did the, he, you know, did they give birth to the, a man I call a prince of Ireland. He was sort of Irish nobility. Now, eventually he gets into the, you know, movement to, let's say, to free Ireland from British rule. He's a young man. How does he get arrested? Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> you know, he has the wool by the tail. He's young. He's good looking. He speaks well. He's rich. Uh, he's got women throwing themselves at him. He could essentially just inherit the old man's business in Waterford and live a good life with his chums. But what changes him, what really radicalizes him, is the Great Famine. I mean, he's coming of age when a million Irish are starving to death. And and you see it all around. I mean, little children are cowering in the you know, ditches with green-stained teeth, and mothers are holding to starving children. It's this awful, awful crime <clears throat> that's happening. So he he helps to start this revolt. And, you know, it's doomed from the beginning because they're a bunch of 20-something kids, basically, and um, he hides out and tries to get the peasantry to, to, you know, rise up, basically to stop exporting food because the Brits were exporting food at a time when a million Irish are dying. So he he helps to lead this revolt. It's a failed revolt. He hides out. He gets arrested, and then he gets sentenced to be hanged, drawn, and quarters as his and his remains disposed of as Her Majesty shall see fit. He's 24 years old when that happens. Now, did he raise arms against? The British rule? The, the te so he was sentenced to be hanged on and quartered for sedition, and he didn't actually raise arms. He never shot anyone. He never picked up a rifle. He said the Irish people should rise up. And, you know, essentially what they wanted, as I said, was just to stop shipping food out of Ireland. I mean, they, that's one of the great unknowns in Irish history. You talk about people not knowing Mar. Well, at a time when a million Irish are dying, they're sending more food out of Ireland than any other part of the British Empire. So, so his revolt was basically to shut down the ports and keep food from, from leaving Ireland. And by extension, you know, granting the Irish a degree of self-government. 
All right, he's sentenced to death. What happens next? So he sits in this jail cell for a year, and I went to his cell in Dublin. It just really creeped me out to sit in this tiny little cell with an 8-inch by 12-inch you know, window with the light coming through the bars. And he's this kid waiting to be hanged, drawn, and quartered. And then there's the worldwide outrage by the Irish uh, diaspora in Europe and in the United States. And Her Gracious Majesty, the young Queen Victoria, if you've seen the Queen Victoria series playing on PBS, you know she was about Mars age, uh, does commute the sentence. He will no longer be executed, but his new sentence, he's supposed to spend the rest of his life banished in Tasmania as a political prisoner. Now, Tasmania is near Australia. It's south of Australia. It was the Devil's Island part of Australia. Okay, so then he adapts to life there. What's his life like in, in Tasmania? Well, it's important to understand the context. So Britain is trying to make a penal colony out of a continent. And in the course of this incredibly bizarre experiment, they send almost 200,000 Irish to Australia as part of this penal colony. Most of them are just you know poor. They're orphan kids. They're petty criminals. There are people who stole a loaf of bread or shoes, but there's a select niche within that, and those are the political prisoners, and that's what Marr was. He's one of a handful of political prisoners sent to the island of Tasmania, and he's supposed to give his word of honor that he'll never escape. So, you know, he's an educated guy. He's rich. He's got, speaks six languages, and they, the British Empire says, if you agree not to escape, you can spend the rest of your life in this little seven um, mile by seven mile patch of land on the island of Tasmania, south of Australia. Then he makes his escape, and and that's one of the most fascinating parts of the book. Yeah, my kids tell me to stop giving that part away, so... (laughs) Okay. (laughs) He does escape, okay. Yeah, he gets away somehow, let's say. (laughs) I thought it was a pretty gripping part of his story, too. I mean, it's an amazing escape, considering how far it is. It's like escaping from Mars. I mean, he's halfway around the world in the Victorian age, and he somehow makes his way to New York City. Um, So he does, yes, get away. (laughs) He makes his daring escape. And then he arrives in New York City at a time when a million Irish have come ashore, the first great immigrant surge in in our history. And he's, everyone thinks he's going to be the savior. He's greeted as this hero. He's, you know, he's, he's, he can't go anywhere without people trying to kiss him or throw roses at his feet. He's, he's going to be this savior of the Irish masses in America. Obviously, he's a celebrity when he first comes over here. And it's a few years before the Civil War. What about his military activities? How does he get interested in, in military and the militias and so forth? Yeah, so this is a guy who's never, I'm glad you asked that question earlier, he's never even fired a gun before. <laughs> and... You know, the, the slavery is the great evil in American society. It's, it's clearly dividing America, even the 1850s, when all the immigrants are coming around. And the great question, if there's a civil war, is which side would the Irish fight on? Because they are they have all these crappy jobs. I mean, they're building the sewers in New York City. They're digging the canals in upstate. They're, you know, shoveling the crap into the river every night from the Lower East Side, where most of them are huddled in these awful tenements. And they're being told that if, if somehow these four million black slaves, and that's how many there were, we were the largest slave holding nation on earth, are free, they'll come get your crappy jobs. So the question is, which side would the Irish go on? Well, at the start of the Civil War, Marr says, God, there's no way we can fight for anyone but the Union. This country has taken us in. This country has given us refuge. So Lincoln, who's a Republican, and Marr, who's a Democrat, smartly names Marr a general. And he establishes the famous, what will be famous, Irish Brigade coming out of the fighting 69th in New York City, and which the 69th is still around, by the way. And there's some proud members of that great brigade. But so that's, it's sort of a, you know, he's, he's this orator, he's famous, but Lincoln sees a chance for, to have him, you know, move most of the Irish to the side of the Union. Okay, we're going to take a short break right now. You're listening to Ask the Lawyer with me, Mike Connors. We're talking to Timothy Egan author of The Immortal Irishman. Welcome back to the Connors Corner segment of Ask the Lawyer. We're talking to Timothy Egan, author of The Immortal Irishman, The Irish Revolutionary Who Became an American Hero. Okay, so we're at the beginning of the Civil War. Lincoln appoints Marr as a general. What happens to Marr? How, how does the war evolve from his point of view? Yeah, so the, you know, the, the thinking is that the Irish couldn't organize a parade, let alone fight You know, in this, what turns out to be the, the, most, the, the most mortal war in our history, the uh, grievous slaughter of millions of people, essentially all casualties. So they go down to fight the very first battle of Bull Run, just out of Washington, D.C., this motley, mostly New York, almost all New Yorkers, I should say, at this point. 
And the union is routed. I mean, the South kicks their butt and people run, they throw down their guns and everyone's shocked and they, they realize this war is not going to go easy. With one exception, the, the Irishmen from New York City didn't run. They didn't throw down their guns. They st stood their ground and fought and Marr himself is wounded in this thing. So Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, after the, the battle, he wants to find some solace. He goes to visit them and, and personally thanks Marr for his service there. And they will then go on to fight in all the major battles of the Civil War. Um, the, the two bad ones, of course, were Antietam, where more Americans were killed in that one day than any time in our history. There were 22,000 casualties on that day. And then Fredericksburg, where the Irish Brigade is slaughtered. Marr loses two-thirds of his men in that long, horrible battle, and it just sort of breaks his heart. Now, there's some controversy about Marr at Fredericksburg. Why wasn't he in the charge? Well, you know, he he was leading, he, he had a horrible knee abscess, and I've seen the medical records of that. He could hardly walk. He had one of these giant inflamed things. You know, these guys would sit around in these miserable camps in the winter and just wait, you know, months and months and months between the actual battle. And he developed this horrible thing that made it very difficult for him to walk. So he does give his men the night before the battle these green sprigs of boxwood and tells them to put them under their caps and that when they find the bodies the next day, they'll know they died as Irish. And by the way, when President Kennedy went to Ireland, the first American president in office to ever visit Ireland, um, he told the story of the Battle of Fredericksburg. So Marr initially can't lead the charge because of what happens with his knee, but he does. He's, he's actually in the battle at, you know, at Fredericksburg. He's not hanging out behind. He's part of the brigade that takes to tries to take this horrible hill and never does take it. Okay, so they suffer. The Irish Brigade suffers terrible casualties. Antietam, Fredericksburg. The brigade is practically decimated and is almost gone. What does Marr do at that point? So, and it's important to know that two things. They say, historians say, and this is an objective assessment, that the Irish Brigade probably took more casualties as a brigade than all but one other brigade. So they, they really did take a lot of loss. Uh, number two, they were heroic in most of the battles they were in. You can see the uh, memorials to them from everything from Gettysburg to Antietam. But since Marr had personally recruited all these men, I mean, he knew their mothers, he knew their wives, he knew their brothers. He could tell you what counties they were from. They were all part of it, you know, a relatively small country. They were like his friends and blood brothers. And he'd seen all these people, you know, he told them to fight. He's the one who would personally recruited them. And so he felt the pain of their loss. So he resigns his civil war generalship after the losses. He's, he really is a broken man. And now we see this act five, this amazing last act of his life. He's revitalized by being named the territorial governor of the territory of Montana, which is an area five times the size of Ireland. He's never been, you know, he's been to San Francisco, but he's never been to the mountain West before. So he goes, he and his beloved wife go out West to start this last chapter of his life as a Montana governor. And Montana this is 18, you know, right after the Civil War. So it's not exactly a civilized uh, society. No. Hey, if you've seen the HBO series Deadwood, you, you see a dead on representation. It's absolutely wide open. I mean, there's whores in every saloon. There's men being strung up by these vigilantes who didn't give a damn that they were under a democracy, a rule of law. They would decide that someone was a bad hombre and they would string them up without, you know, even giving them a trial. Um, it, it's just this wide open, festering sore of a society, and Marr tries to recreate it uh, as something called New Ireland. And interestingly, my family came to Montana and you know went to Butte, Montana, which was a big mining center. They say more Gaelic was spoken there than anywhere but Dublin. And um, you know, so he he thought we could bring the civilizing influence to this place, and he thought that they could, you know, the Irish masses who were living in these horrible tenements in the cities could come west and start fresh. And what he runs into is what historians have called the largest campaign of vigilante violence in American history. And that's the, that's what sets up his final battle. You know, when I read the history books, I just read that Marr was on a boat, he got drunk, and he fell off the boat. But you have a th different theory. Yeah, and I'm glad you at least knew who Marr was. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> a lot of people didn't. If you go to Montana right now, everyone knows who Marr is. And 
there's this giant statue in front of the Capitol of Mar on a horse, uh, heroic. That's when I first discovered him myself. And the, I, I was walking by the statue with the governor. And I said, who's the guy on the horse? And he said, uh, you call yourself an Irishman and you don't know who Thomas Francis Mar is. I said, no, I never heard of the guy. And um, so, yeah, he's, here's the important thing to know. His death is a mystery. He was 43 years old. He was, he got in the face of these vigilantes. He had pardoned a guy that the vigilantes were scheduled to kill, and they grabbed him the day of the pardon, strung him up uh, by this hanging tree in Helena, Montana, and in his pocket was Mars' pardon. They later sent a note to the governor saying, you're next. So I try to make the case that Mar was actually murdered. Now, it's also important to know that the people who wrote the history, the early history of Montana, were basically the vigilantes and the Freemasons. They were the people who may have been behind his loss, his murder. So they told this tale, which played into a classic narrative of the Irish that eh, he's a drunken Irishman. He just fell off the boat into the Missouri River. The poor governor, you know, we hate to see him go, but that's how it goes with the Irish. And, you know, there's lots of evidence that he didn't have anything to drink that day that um, he probably was murdered. That's the case I try to make. You know, in retrospect, taking a look at, at Mars' life, there was a lot of tragedy in his life. You know, and that really is the story of the Irish. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but it's the truth, is that Irish history is basically long periods of misery, misery and tragedy punctuated by periods of joy. And the, the great triumph of the Irish is that they, you know, we as people still find joy and, and still find light and still find funny stuff and still find, you know, things that, to be positive about in the midst of all this misery. You're absolutely right. But here's this important legacy. You're right. It is mostly tragic. I mean, he loses a wife, he loses so many friends, he's banished, so he'll never see Ireland again, this great orator. But here's the great thing, and this is why I call him the immortal Irishman. He actually changed history on three continents, and let me quickly say how. In, in his home state of Ireland, they eventually did gain their freedom in the 20th century after 800 years of British oppression. And during the revolution, the uprising of 1916, Mars' words were really instrumental in the Easter Rising. Uh, in Australia, there are free Australians in part because of him. While he was banished down there, he wrote under a pseudonym all these tracts for newspapers that helped to end the penal colony experiment. And in the United States, as Marr himself acknowledged, um, there are free blacks because of the sacrifice that the Irish Brigade made in the Civil War. So, I mean, I'm happy that this is the 150th anniversary of Marr's death, and later this year at Greenwood Cemetery, in New York, um, there'll, there'll be a ceremony there. I'm going to go to it where a, a bust of Mar will be placed next to the grave of his wife. And they just, by the way, named the biggest bridge in Ireland after him as well. So I'm, I'm happy to see his words live on and his deeds live on. And that's why I call him the mortal. How many people do you think know who Thomas Francis Mar is today? Yeah, he's he's celebrated in Ireland. Everyone, I was there last fall doing some readings and, you know, he's, People know his story. They don't quite know the American West part. Everybody in Montana knows who he is. There is a Mar County. There's um, not just the statue in front of the Capitol, but there's bus of him all over. And you can start an argument in any bar in Montana when you uh, when you raise the question of how he was killed. Um, and he's certainly known in New York City. And that's a great thing that I found that uh, because of the fighting 69th Brigade that came out of New York and became the Irish Brigade. Um, and there's, you know, Mar taverns and bars in different places all across the United States. When I was touring on this book, uh, people would call in from there and say, hey, you know, there's someone here who's a descendant of Mar. And, and so, but, but overall, I don't think people know him. I mean, again, he was as famous as John F. Kennedy was at one point. People talked about him. He was the leader and, you know, of the Irish masses. He, was the, he could attract 10, 20,000 people to a speech. And that's sometimes, you know, what happens in history. Someone is extraordinarily famous in their time, and then they pass into an asterisk. I'm trying to res resurrect him because I think his story is so important to today, all the things going on today. Well, thank you for bringing history to life. Timothy Egan, the immortal Irishman, the Irish revolutionary who became an American hero. Thank you for writing the book. Anybody out there, if you want to learn more about this period in history, about the Irish in the United States in the Civil War, by the book, The Immortal Irishman. Great. Thanks so much for having me. I, I'll second that emotion. Okay. <laughs>